can I start by thanking the Institute for inviting me? Uh, it's always particularly uh, stimulating to, to go somewhere and be able to share your ideas with a very broad audience. Uh, and I'm actually going to give something, I've been asked to give something which is a cross between a public lecture and an academic seminar, so it may be a little bit bumpy in parts as we shift backwards and forwards. But the main thing I want to try and do is to get us to rethink this whole idea of global ageing. I don't work on old people. I never have worked on old people. But I do work on something which I think is one of the huge challenges for the 21st century across the globe, as I'll try and point out, which is the changing age composition of the world. And it is going to fundamentally change our economies, societies, politics, uh, global migration, etc. Uh, and that's really what I want to talk about today. Um, yes. Population. I don't know whether any of you are aware, but the Royal Society last week launched its population on the planet. We had, I sat on that working group, and in fact I was responsible for the demography of that. And we had a huge press interest that was vaguely positive. Uh, and we wanted to do two things. One, we wanted to put population demography back on the international agenda. It fell off in the 90s for a variety of reasons that we can discuss afterwards, but there isn't time to now. And then also to talk about consumption, the changing consumption patterns of the world. And when we started this working group, there was very much a feeling that population was all about population expansion. And this is the old story. When people talk about population, it's about overpopulation and how can this world sustain up to 24 billion people. And one of my jobs on that working party was to say, no, the population is going to change in some very complex ways. It is not just going to grow larger. It is going to change in terms of its density. We're all going to become far more urban. We currently have about 50% of the world population living in urban centres. That will rise to about 75% by the end of the century. It is going to change in its distribution. Not only are we becoming more mobile, but as I will talk about in the talk, that kind of migration pattern is going to change. And really importantly, it's going to change in its composition. These age structural changes are going to have a huge impact on our economies and our societies. Now, as I said, when I was teaching demography uh, 20 years or so, the really big question was how can we stop the world population reaching 24 billion? Then we started to talk about, well, no, maximum world population will be about 12 billion. And now we think it will hit 10 billion by 2050 and then stabilise. And the reason for that is this, falling fertility. Nobody, I think, realised how quickly the total fertility rate, that's the number of children for women of childbearing age, would come down over the last 20 years. If we take uh, replacement to be 2.1, then we can say that two-thirds of the world's countries are now at, near or below replacement level. So in terms of total fertility rate, we have countries like Thailand, which is now lower than the UK. We have Vietnam, which is uh, lower than New Zealand and about just uh, a couple uh, of um, points uh, above the UK. Uh, we have the lowest total fertility rate in the world in... Does anyone know which country has the lowest total fertility rate? <laughs> it's, it's one, everyone always says exactly the same thing. It, it's it's um, actually Hong Kong less than one child per woman. I, I recently said this at a lecture and someone put his hand up and said the Vatican, which, which I suppose maybe officially, but unofficially. Um, uh, and what that picture is, that fertility has come down as these countries have economically developed. And we know pretty well how to reduce total fertility rate. And it's a combination of improving child and maternal health, improving female education, and family planning programmes. But this idea that we've got to worry now about dramatic growth in the world population has actually, if you like, by itself solved it as we've educated women and allowed them to choose the number of children that they have. And as a consequence, here we've mapped the total fertility rate. If you look at the yellow, these countries are below replacement now. And you can see that not only is it the OECD countries, but increasingly many countries in Asia uh, and even in Latin America. And if you look at the beige, they are at or very near to below replacement. And indeed, you can see very, very clearly, with the exception of here, these the, the red, the African countries, predominantly African countries, where we still have over four children per reproductive woman, uh, that across the globe, total fertility rate has come down naturally. Now, I'm going to talk in a minute about China. People often go on about the one child 
policy. Uh, in fact, I was asked only last week whether India should have a one-child policy. If you map the fall in total fertility rate in China and you put next to it the natural fall in total fertility rate that occurred in Southeast Asia, they actually map onto each other perfectly. In other words, China had to bring its uh, total fertility rate down, but naturally those countries in Southeast Asia were beginning to do that themselves. So much so that we now have entered into what we call potentially the second demographic transition. And the second demographic transition basically says, are we going to get trapped in what we call a low fertility trap? And countries such as Germany and China and Japan and even Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, etc., are beginning to question whether they will ever be able to raise their uh, total fertility rate. And that argument is that if you have more than one generation that has a total fertility rate of below 1.5, then those societies adapt. And particularly, the young reproductive population starts to adapt to the idea of just one child. And it isn't just that we're having individual women having one child, we're having them delaying and delaying and delaying. A third of the UK females aged 35 have yet to have their first child, and a considerable percentage of those will never have a child. Uh, partly because of secondary infertility, which means they were fertile, but as they come up to their 40s, they tend not to be, and yes, you can do all the IVF in the world, but you're not actually going to have a huge impact on the demography of a country. You'll affect an individual, but it really won't impact uh, at the um, national level. And also their lifestyles have changed. Women are deciding not to have children. We have a huge group of young women throughout the world, not just in Europe, who are making the decision to be childless. Uh, and I think there's some wonderful evidence now coming out of China. It's very much anecdotal. We don't have the hard data. But in China, we now have, if you think the one-child policy was uh, started in 1981, we now therefore have a whole cohort of young one children, male and female, who are now at prime reproductive age, and they are choosing just to have one child. They're allowed to have more, but they're choosing to have one, because that's their common experience. So a lot of, of Europe, and increasingly Southeast Asia, and you can see that flowing across the globe, is talking about the second demographic transition, and whether, in fact, we'll be stuck in a low fertility trap. And that obviously has huge implications when you understand the impact that that's happening on its demography. I think it's a good thing, because, as I say, we're not going to go to 24 billion. We are likely to stabilise at about 10 billion, if we can get Africa right, and that's another conversation we can have afterwards. But it does mean that some countries are really having to rethink uh, what's happening uh, to their uh, demography. As a consequence, we are ageing our populations, uh, and we're not just uh, ageing Europe. If you look at uh, the green, the blue, the red, and the orange, no, let's just do green, red, let's just do green, blue, and red, that is those countries of the world which will have over a third, over a quarter, and over 20% of their population, what we now consider to be old age, and we can talk about this later because, of course, that's very contested. 60 will mean increasingly very different things by the time we get to 2050. But, but that's basically how one can look at it. Unless you start changing policies and taking age 60 to be irrelevant, which in health terms increasingly it should be, otherwise that is the percentage of the population that you're going to have out of economic employment. I had some other graphs, which I've just taken out because I don't have enough time, which shows how this then replicates into the percentage of the workforce uh, going forward uh, across uh, the globe. Now, one of the things that I will argue and, and do argue is that this population ageing, this change in age structure, we've looked at it in the wrong way. We've tended to concentrate on this kind of a figure and say, oh my goodness, we're going to have populations which will be increasingly elderly, and that is the problem, pension, social security, long-term care, instead of saying, no, there are two distinctive drivers here. There's the one I've been talking about, which is falling fertility, which obviously is affecting the percentage of elderly going forward, but there's also increasing longevity and falling mortality at the later ages, and that's much more around health care. And I'm going to divide the rest of the time that's left to me uh, into these two very distinctive issues. What happens to economies when we have falling fertility? What happens to them when we have increasing longevity? So, let's look at this. <clears throat> Actually, let's go back. If I can go back and talk you through it. So, falling fertility. The argument around falling fertility is very simple. 
that as you have falling fertility go through a population, as you predict it going forwards, or in fact, obviously, you can look back at those changing trends, then the combination of particular age groups is going to impact upon your economies and your societies. And for the economists, that's a very, very simple sort of life course economic idea that at certain times of our lives, we tend to behave economically in different ways. When we're younger, we tend to produce, we tend to consume, uh, and we tend to save. And as we get older, we reduce our production, we reduce our consumption, and we draw down on our investments. And you can actually see these long-term demographic trends in economies. And I just want to show you one uh, paper which I think illustrates this very well. This is a paper that came out of the States by Zeng and Spiegel. And what they did was they took long-term trends, 1954 uh, up to, in fact, this is predicted to 2014, but we can stay here, which is round about uh, where we are at the moment. And they showed that if you look at the UK, the US stock market, okay, we do have the uh, cyclical fluctuations, which are annual, but the long trend, they argue, was very much driven by the changing demography uh, of the US. In other words, in 1981, uh, all the members of that large post-war uh, birth cohort was in the labor market, they were working, they were saving, they were driving the US economy, and from 2004 onwards, they started to retire, they stopped saving, and they drew down their investments. And a group of them, a group of uh, economists are now working, not only looking at the US, but looking at Japan, looking at Germany, and saying we have to understand these long-term demographic uh, impacts. And these, of course, are primarily uh, driven by changes in the fertility rate, these long-term trends that come out. Very similar work has also been done by Bo Malberg's work in Scandinavia, looking at housing build. And it's, it works brilliantly in Sweden, but they're also now doing it in other OC, OECD countries. Exactly the same, showing how the changing demography of the population is changing the requirements uh, in the housing market. And the third area I want to talk about uh, in, in this area is the impact on employment and, and the labour market. Um, and this is just very quickly to represent that. Uh, what we've mapped here is um, OECD countries uh, looking at the first uh, three decades of uh, this century. And it, what we see very clearly here is if we look at the blue, which, if you like, are the incoming cohorts into OECD labour markets, how they are going to, from about 2015, start to fall. And the outgoing ones, uh, which are in the red, they are going to increase. And if I say that these projections take into account migration, you can see why many OECD countries, and particularly Europe, are going to have difficulties because of their changing demography. Their age structural change is one of uh, older populations uh, and decline. And I think this works leads very much into a sort of uh, policy discussion, which is around things like the recent World Bank report that showed that, in fact, Europe is not going to be able to attract the skills it requires in an upcoming world of a shortage of skills. And one of the reasons they suggest uh, links into some recent work by Manpower, which has looked at what is happening in China. And China is the only uh, country in the world that has mapped its occupational structure by age. And it knows at what year it's going to have a downturn in each occupational group. And Manpower suggests that they are geared up to actually start cherry-picking the world's skills. And one of the areas I do a lot of work in is Southeast Asia, and the governments of Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, even Indonesia, are becoming very concerned about China cherry-picking the best. In the way that we have in Europe, we've cherry-picked the best for the last 50 years or so. And they suggest that the brain drain will eventually, by about 2030, flip from the US over to China. So if you're a bright young graduate, I normally say from Oxford, but let's just say from Trinity, you won't go and work for First Boston in New York for five years, you'll go and work for a bank in Shanghai. And I think the, the demographic, uh, the demography of the labour market is something that internationally uh, is going to really have an impact, particularly on things like global migration trends. Because one of the ways that the old countries, old rich countries of the Northern Hemisphere, we've propped up our economies by exporting economic capital to the South and importing human capital. And that kind of North-South migration is going to be significantly disrupted over the first half of the 20th century, uh, 21st century. 
I'm going to very, very quickly move on now because I know I have a, a quite a tight uh, schedule to get through all of this, but to go on to the other one, the other side, and we can talk about it later in the questions. We've looked at some of the impacts that falling fertility is going to have uh, on national and, and global economies. Let's look at the other side, uh, falling mortality rates, late life mortality rates, and uh, increases in longevity. And I'm going to illustrate this. This actually is English data because England has fantastic uh, data going back. England and Sweden have some of the best historical demographic data in the world. Just to try and understand the way that we really have altered longevity. And this is, uh, a, uh, th this is looking at uh, the survival curves and this is the rectangulization of that survival curve. And if you look at 1851 in England, you can see this is the age along the bottom and this is the proportion si surviving. We had deaths across the life course. Death across the life course was common and we pushed back that death so that by uh, 2011 it's not quite rectangular, uh, but that is uh, very much uh, how we've um, managed to, to push it. So much so that in 1851 less than half the population reached 46 uh, and currently we have half our population in England uh, at 85. And of course, if you want to talk about you know, the impact on pensions, uh, then if, we, if when uh, the first pension, national pension in the UK uh, in um, 1908 was introduced, uh, you can see that in actual fact, 72 uh, was the age uh, at which uh, uh, half the population uh, was, uh, had, had died. Uh, and if we're going to extrapolate uh, that, uh, we should have a state pension age of about 80. And if we want to extrapolate uh, what was happening in 1800s uh, uh, when Bismarck introduced his European pension, then the pension age we should be looking at in order to keep it in line with the Bismarckian calculations is an English pension age of 103. So we really have changed in the last 150 years or so uh, the, the structure of our population quite considerably. Uh, what, what I want to do is actually take you through this bit. Let's take 1911 to 2011. People often say, how did this happen? Uh, we can say basically that in this part of the graph, it, a lot of it was public health, increased nutrition, increased sanitation. Uh, but from about 1911 onwards, we started to get medical and scientific advances uh, coming in. And I just want to show you this. What we've done here is take UK male mortality last century, uh, we've divided it into four main, um, these are ONS data, uh, the four main uh, killers uh, of men during that time. And you can see very uh, clearly how those killers have changed across the century. Um, with the exception of the yellow, which is cancer, <coughs> where we actually, interestingly enough, have not made that many inroads. And the interesting thing about cancer is that incidence is increasing and death is declining. And that means that probably due to environmental factors, lifestyle, we're increasing incidences, but medical uh, efforts mean that we're reducing deaths. But if we took, um, for example, respiratory, uh, obviously here we have um, the flu epidemic. This, sorry, this is green, it's respiratory. You can see basically that's been downward. Uh, and if you look at the others, which are here, circulatory is blue and infections red, they also have steadily come downwards. And a lot of this, particularly from here onwards, has been around medicine and science. The really interesting thing, of course, is what's going to happen here. Uh, are we going to see a continued decline? Uh, those people who work on infectious diseases, there's a big debate at the moment. I'm sure you've all heard about uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria and whether or not we're going to have an increase in infectious diseases. Uh, the general view of my colleagues at Oxford is no. Uh, because of things like the new genetics, we understand the DNA of pathogens, we'll be able always to be ahead of the game in terms of the pharma, of the drug therapy, but it will come at a cost, uh, and that's something we can uh, come back to. Um, and the other big thing, obviously, is this, which is the circulatory, the blue. And that tells a wonderful, wonderful public health story. Uh, what happened in the UK uh, around about the 1970s, a lot of this came out of Richard Pito's work, was the understanding of the impact of smoking on late life deaths, particularly for men. And there was a huge public health uh, drive and men basically gave up smoking. Women didn't. Men dramatically uh, decreased their smoking. And as a consequence, deaths from cardiovascular disease, stroke and lung cancer in the male population just dropped dramatically. And you can see that here. This is more ONS figures. This is heart disease deaths. 
This is the male cohort coming through into later life, and you can see the dramatic reduction we've had in deaths from heart disease uh, in England and Wales over the last 20 years. And similarly, exactly the same, cancer and stroke-related deaths have gone down. <coughs> so the really, really big question that we have to tackle is this. The new lifestyle disease of the 21st century is obesity. Now, will obesity have the same kind of decline that we saw in the public health, uh, sorry, the, the lifestyle disease of the 20th century smoking? And I don't have time to show you this data, but I'll just talk you through it. We've recently done some, some very, um, or, or drawn upon some very interesting work that has been done, control, uh, uh, assessing two particular uh, uh, meta-studies. And one of them looked at the data on, around obesity from 1979 across to 1996, drawing on OEC data. And the second one looks at data from 1996 across to uh, 2006. And the reason I was interested in that actually came out of the States, because those of you who are familiar with this will know that the United States has a far lower life expectancy than one would uh, presume uh, given its position economically within a, the OECD. It is below the OECD average. And one of the arguments is the impact of obesity. We now have up to uh, a third of some states with obese uh, uh, individuals. Um, and that obesity is in some way reducing life expectancy, in the same way that smoking reduced male life expectancy at the end of last century. And what they are suggesting is that when you look at these two studies, Although rates of obesity have gone up dramatically, significantly, uh, over uh, those two time periods between the 80s and 90s and the 90s and 2000s, it looks as if its impact on life expectancy has actually gone down. So people are beginning to argue, why is that? And one of the reasons may be because of drug therapy. In other words, if people are not changing their lifestyles as they did with smoking. They're continuing to overconsume calories, to eat and to drink, to become obese, because they can pop a pill a statin or a lipid reduction or a hypertension, which reduces the long-term effects of diabetes, the symptoms of cancer, cardiovascular disease. And if that is the case, then we are moving into a world where some people will say, fine, science is solving a lifestyle problem, but at, again, a cost. And one of the things we can talk about maybe afterwards uh, is some research that we've done uh, which looks at... Um, the difference, for example, in the US and Japan uh, in terms of how they're treating these lifestyle diseases. I have five minutes, is that correct? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Stand if you want. I, I just want to uh, highlight some other work we've done because, as you saw, we are, we are dramatically increasing life expectancy in OECD countries. In fact, in, in most countries outside Africa, life expectancy is going up. And because of that, we have governments who are saying, as I inferred when we were talking about the pension ages, that as we're living longer, uh, so we should be pushing back state pension ages. People should be working longer. Now, I personally believe that actually you should be able to work as long as you want to. I'm very much pro getting rid of any kind of age discrimination. I can't see why you can't have you know, race discrimination and gender discrimination, but you can still have age discrimination, but that's another, another conversation. But I think we must be careful that we, that we don't look at the national figures and ignore the huge uh, variation uh, that, that we see. And I want to illustrate that with just a small piece of work that we have done in the UK, which is looking in detail at some of these national figures. And this is looking at inequality in mortality. Um, we have access to a very large UK data set, nearly 2 million pension records. These are occupational pension records, so we are picking up those people who are sufficiently well-educated to be in an occupation where you have an occupational pension, so if you like, we've already sliced off that bottom group. And what we are able to do, those of you who know about the Whitehall study in the UK, which showed differential in um, uh, late life mortality, uh, we can answer some of those questions, but with far more power, because we have nearly two million. Uh, half a million of these people are already dead, so we can actually, you know, we, th these are actual mortalities we're looking at. And what we did was we divided our groups into two uh, sort of outlying groups, uh, we're just going to show you men here, uh, and we have uh, what we call our low group. They're the low-income, ill-health retiree who had an unhealthy lifestyle, and our high-income, normal-health retiree and a healthy lifestyle. 
And you can see that if you are 65, if you're in the low group, you've got 12 years of life expectancy left. If you're in the high group, you've got up to 23. That is an 11-year difference. And if we look at this uh, uh, schematically, uh, this is the proportion of 65-year-old men expected to survive to each older age. Uh, the ages along the bottom, the probability uh, on the y-axis. And we're comparing the green, unhealthy, low-income group with the blue, healthy uh, group. And you can see, uh, particularly when you get into your 80s, a uh, huge difference in life expectancies. Now, what we were all also able to do was actually to tease out, because we've got quite a lot of power in this study, tease out the impact of different facts on longevity. And these are independent, okay, because uh, many of you are going to sit there and say, oh, yes, but this is all related. These are actually independent. So if we took our manual employee, poor, unhealthy lifestyle, ill health retiree, as you saw, he had only 12 years of life expectancy. If he'd returned in normal health, he could have added a 1.8 years on. If it had a healthy lifestyle, 4.6. If it had a high income, 4. And interestingly enough, if he'd done a non-manual job, only 0.7. So the impact of occupation was much, much less than we thought. But look here. Healthy lifestyle actually adds on more than anything else. And so I think we are beginning to really, really understand the role of healthy lifestyle across the life course and the role that public health can really make if you like, in reducing that late life burden of ill health and dependency that we see at the end of lives. So if we put these, these two uh, drivers together, then we can see very clearly that falling fertility is actually having particular effects on our economies and societies. Increasing longevity is having a very different set of effects. And a lot of those are going to be around health. If we are going to have a third of our population aged over 60, and they're going to have health profiles that are uh, disability and frailty, and they're going to be alive for 30 years in increasing frailty, societies are going to have massive public health bills to deal with, long-term care, social care, etc. If, however, we can push back disability and frailty, and we can keep healthy life expectancy, so healthy life expectancy keeps up with life expectancy, then it's a very, very different situation. Because we have these individuals staying in our workforces, and particularly in OECD countries, we need that because we're going to have to compete with Southeast Asia and these Asian growth uh, centres for our skills. So we need people to stay in the labour market more. We know that they're experienced. Uh, and we know that current cohorts coming through are very well educated, far more than the cohorts coming through before. But... If we're not careful, we're going to have a situation where we're pushing pension ages back to 75. I stuck my neck out about three years ago and said I thought state pension would hit 70 in my lifetime. And then David Cameron last month, I think, or earlier in the year, announced that you know, 70 was something that the government was potentially looking at. Um, we're going to have huge numbers of people falling into disability benefit and staggering along for a few years until they can get their pension. So it, it, it is a complex story. But you can see that the two drivers are having two very different impacts on our economy. Um, finally, just to conclude, I want to just show you how really where we are going uh, with this life expectancy. A lot of work has recently been done on centenarians. One of my demographers recently, at the end of last year, did some predictions on the percentage of centenarians uh, in the UK population across the century. And this is because there's a new group called Biodemography. Uh, we are working on this, um, the Max Planck Institute, Jay Shansky in Chicago. And what these uh, biodemographers are trying to do is to look at the new science, stem cell research, nanotechnology, the new genetics, and say, how is this going to impact upon future longevity? And my colleague produced some statistics, and we <coughs> said, you're, you're mad, sorry, this cannot, cannot be the case. And then about three weeks later, the ONS, which is a rather sort of boring, you know, uh, group of statisticians, that they're, they're not wacky statisticians at all, they produced this for the UK. This is the projected number of centenarians in the UK, and it was higher uh, than the work that we had done. We currently have about 12,000 centenarians. They are predicting that we will be approaching 400,000, uh, nearly half a million centenarians by the middle of the century, and a million, heading for a million centenarians by, 20, uh, by the end of the 21st century. There are eight, m we have eight million people who are currently alive uh, in the UK. They say we'll reach 100. Uh, 1.6 million of those are already over 60. 
Uh, three million of the under 16 year olds. But it fits in with what do other demographers are saying. Uh, Val Pell out of the Max Planck Institute, he is predicting that half the baby girls born at the end of last century will live into three centuries. So my daughter, who was born in 1996, has a really good chance of making it into the 22nd century. Um, they're also suggesting that the 2007 birth cohort, if you do this kind of analysis, uh, has a life expectancy of 103. So we really, really are pushing back the boundaries. We're not having babies and we're all living longer and it's going to have a profound impact on our society. And I'm just going to put up, I think it's three pictures so that we can discuss it. Because I think we need also to look at some of the social uh, and conceptual implications. And my Number one is generational succession. Uh, we live in a society where our societies, communities, families, workplaces are used to the idea that you pass down assets, wealth and status in a particular regular uh, time. What happens when we don't inherit from our parents till we're 80 or from our grandparents till we're 80? How are we going to adjust our workplaces to these very, very long, possibly, potentially healthy lives? Uh, what is going to happen to the life course? This is at Blackfriars Station. It's the seven ages of man. If ever you go through Blackfriars Station, I think it's the most interesting thing, or the interesting, most interesting reason for going to Blackfriars Station. Um, if we're going to be living 120, 130, 140 years, which some people say we are, I, I think we will have large numbers of people living over 115. I may not stretch it beyond that this century, but still. Are we going to have 12 ages of man, or are we going to start stretching out our life courses? It's crazy that we're in education, then work, and then we've got 50 years of retirement ahead of us. How is society going to uh, adjust uh, to that? I, I recently talked to the City of London Boys' School, and um, I thought they were going to be sixth formers, and they turned out to be between 12 and 18. And I thought, how do I talk to young boys about this? So I split them into two groups, and I said, you're going to live till you're 50. You're going to live till you're 150. And bearing in mind, you know, when you're a 12-year-old, 50 is so beyond the pale, I thought, this may not work. And a little boy sitting over there said, if I'm going to live till I'm 150, I'm not going to start having kids till I'm 80. But actually, that was the way of thinking. And then finally is this, the generational contract. What's going to happen to the generational contract? Uh, and just to conclude, the generational contract is something that most societies have, and it's very, very similar. And it says that uh, parents bring up children, and in return, children care for parents as they get older. Uh, in Asia, it happens within the family still. In Europe, it happens within the public system because we contribute taxes and those taxes produce uh, pensions and welfare payments. But there are a whole a group, uh, including um, one of my philosophers in my institute, and they are beginning to say, given the success of current cohorts in reducing their fertility and their mortality, and they've benefited from that. They've had less dependent children so they can benefit and they're going to live longer because their mortality rate is going down, should they not be bearing more responsibility for their old age? Uh, and I, I think it really does raise quite an interesting question uh, about this generational contract uh, and how we're really going to negotiate it, because this is happening very, very quickly. I think that's the other thing, the speed at which uh, these life expectancy increases and these fertility uh, falls are happening is quite extraordinary. And that's just a picture of Oxford. To finish. Thank you. Thank you.